Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. Kids, you can be dismissed with your teachers. Some of you may already know this, but Heather's grandmother uh, passed away uh, this past week. So Pastor Reed and Heather are going to be gone, um, and they're at the funeral there. And that's why I'm preaching this week instead of next week, so we're going to kind of flip-flop and axe a little bit. But Reed will be back next week to pick up, and uh, we won't miss any of the passages um, in Acts. And if you, don't, if you didn't follow that, just, just hang in there with us. Uh, we're still going to be in Acts. <coughs> Today is March 12th, which means we just surpassed a special anniversary on February 21st. Does anyone know what that anniversary was? I'll give you a hint. A school is named after him. 71 years ago, Jim Elliott landed in Ecuador. As a missionary to those Indians, he went with four other men. They were committed to bringing the gospel where no one had gone before. They felt a calling on their life. The Spirit had called them, and then they obeyed and went to Ecuador. (coughs) And if you know the story, then you know that these five men obeyed God, and it meant giving up their lives for the sake of the gospel. The last few weeks we've spent in Acts, and we've gone over the call to faithfully preach the gospel. We've talked about the cost that comes with following Christ, and today we will talk about the obedience that God demands of us. A lot of our time in Acts has been learning about the Spirit of God and how he interacts with us. And our passage this morning speaks of this again. We get to see how the Holy Spirit of God interacts with Philip, and then how his obedience leads to transformation. Much like the transformation that happened when Jim Elliot witnessed to those Indians, after they killed him, many of them came to Christ. His obedience, their transformation. It reminds me of the story of Saul also, but that's another message, so we won't go into that one. We'll be in Acts 8, if you want to turn there now. Acts 8, verse 26. If you need a Bible this morning, there should be a black Bible in the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab that. If you do not own a Bible, please take that home with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have a Bible. So let's beginning. In verse twen- uh, reading in verse 26, and we're going to go through to verse 40. <clears throat> An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. And the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. And when Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? And Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. 
Philip appeared in Azotus, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Let's pray this morning. Father, I ask that you use me this morning, please, that you would give me a clear voice, that your spirit would work among us. Please strengthen me to proclaim your word. Would you stir our hearts? Would you teach us this morning? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are going to see the story, a story of evangelism, and see how obedience leads to transformation. Our main idea in this passage is going to be this. God equips us in every way through the power of his spirit to walk in obedience. And as we begin, I want to give you a little bit of a background of Philip. If you remember in chapter 6, Philip was one of the men, one of the seven chosen to serve as a deacon and to serve in that church in Jerusalem. But then Saul began persecuting, and the church scattered, we learned last week. So Philip went down into Samaria, and he began a ministry there. His ministry grew very quickly. Crowds would gather to see him, and it was a thriving ministry. Pastor Reed will touch more on Samaria and what happens there next week. But first, I want to look at Philip's obedience. Look there in verse 26, where it says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. Note that Philip does not hesitate. He got up and went. Then again in verse 29, where it says, The Spirit told Philip, Go and join that chariot. And we see that Philip ran up to it. He does not hesitate again. Two times, God tells Philip to do something, and two times, Philip obeys. And at first glance, you may think, this isn't a big deal. He's supposed to obey God. We are supposed to obey God. He's a deacon. He's Philip the evangelist. He should obey. But remember the context that we just gave to this. He was in Samaria, where crowds were coming to hear him preaching. A thriving ministry. People were coming to Christ. The church was growing exponentially. Even in verse 8, it says, there was great joy in that city. So this was a great ministry. I'm sure he was pleased to be there. He was excited about the gospel movement in Samaria. And then the Spirit of God calls him to a desert. Probably not that exciting. But nonetheless, he obeys. And he got up and went to the desert because he was not about his own ministry. He was about God's ministry. Looking at this from an outsider's perspective, you might think, he's crazy. Why would you leave a growing ministry where God is clearly working to go to a desert? But he was sensitive and he obeyed Christ. Also, notice the drastic change. In Samaria, crowds were coming to listen to him, and then he was called to a one-on-one interaction, from crowds to one-on-one. God had been working in this Ethiopian's life, and there was a divine appointment that was already planned. I want to also see Philip was sensitive to the Spirit. It did not take the Spirit repeating himself over and over. The angel and the Spirit spoke, and Philip listened. He was sensitive to the leading of God. His pursuit of God had given him the closeness closeness to hear God and to know what he wanted. And so I ask you, friend, when is the last time that you heard from the Spirit of God? When was the last time you felt conviction over your sin or a prompting into obeying God's will? 
so often in our lives we have noise that keeps us from hearing the Spirit's voice. Our noise and our distractions sometimes take priority over the Spirit. Well, how can we as a busy culture quiet ourselves so that we hear from God? Psalm 46.10 is a common verse. I'm sure many of you know it. As a child, I learned it in the ESV, and it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. But I like the CSB version also, which says, Stop fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted in the earth. So stop fighting. It's as if God is saying, calm down and listen. That's a phrase that I say way too often. I'm sure parents know what I'm talking about. It's like when I'm trying to tell the boys something, and they're over here wrestling, being chaotic. They can't hear me. They're not listening. It's only when they quiet themselves and calm down when they can hear and understand what I'm saying to them. Well, I can be the same way when I busy myself with my agenda, my planning, my hobbies, my family, my ministry. It makes it difficult to hear God when really I just need to stop and be still. We can quiet ourselves by sitting at the feet of Jesus and being still so that our heart and our desires come in tune with his heart and his desires. Sitting quietly with our Father will increase our intimacy with him, and it'll deepen our relationship. We will be able to hear the Spirit prompting us, but then, like Philip, we must obey. I love what uh, Oswald Chambers says. <clears throat> he says, One step forward in obedience is worth years of study about it. In other words, you can study about obedience, about what God wants you to do, but at some point you must act. You must take action and actually obey. Secondly, let's look at the boldness that Philip had. <coughs> we pick it up in verse 27. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. Being in charge of the queen's entire treasury <coughs> was probably a big deal. That's a lot of responsibility. This man was probably high up in the government, which also means he was probably traveling with some sort of caravan. And the Holy Spirit proceeds to tell Philip, go and join that chariot. Have you ever been in a meeting or a party when there's someone important or someone that you just want to talk to, but you're trying to muster up enough courage to kind of go talk to them, so you're kind of hanging off to the side, and you're just kind of like shy, and you don't want to really go up there. And then there's the one guy in the room who's almost oblivious to who this person is, and he's just talking to everybody. It's like he's ignorant of the room. That's kind of how I feel like Philip may have been. <coughs> Philip did not lack courage. He was filled with the Spirit, and it was the, it was the Spirit empowering him with boldness. It says he ran up to that chariot. So how in the world can this guy be so bold? Well, because God was calling him to do something, and it was the Spirit of God who would give him the strength, specifically here the boldness, to do it. You see, we are called to obey God through the Spirit. We are not called to obey in our own strength. We are not to shrink back in a lack of faith, but rather to step forward into what God has for us, to step forward in his strength, knowing that we have the Spirit and he will give us the strength to accomplish his work. He says so. Acts 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is exactly what was happening. The Spirit was giving Philip the boldness to preach in Samaria, and now he's on the desert road with that same boldness to preach to this official. I must also remember that boldness does not equal perfection. We will not get it right every time, but thankfully it's not up to us to be perfect. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. Do you know why we need God to intervene? Because you and I are weak creatures. But when his power is perfected in our weakness, that is when God is glorified. So don't be afraid to run up to that chariot. Well, here we go. Philip has obeyed the Spirit of God. He's traveled to the desert road. The Spirit has given him boldness. And then this is what he says. You can look in verse 30. Philip says, Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the door opens. So lastly, I want to look at Philip's message. There was providential work happening in this official's heart even before Philip got there. God had a sovereign plan for this meeting, and he ordained the time and the place for Philip to begin this gospel conversation. First, we see the message of God is for all people. Think of the past 30 verses that we have been in. This message is for the people in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now this Ethiopian. And the message is this. It's the good news. The news that we have a rescuer that offers us life through the death and resurrection of Jesus who took our sins on the cross, dying in our place. Romans 6, 23 says this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I know you have probably heard that before. You probably learned it as a kid like me. But read it again and let it be new to you. The wages of your sin, my sin, is death. This is reality. You and I deserve to die because our, our sin against God, no matter what the sin is, we have committed, as R.C. Sproul puts it, cosmic treason. Every single little sin that we commit is an act of rebellion against the holy God. And friends, I hate to burst anyone's bubble here, <clears throat> but none of us were born into the family of God. None of us were born good. From our first breath, we were in rebellion against God. We were born children of wrath, slaves to sin, slaves to darkness. Growing up in church does not make you a child of God. Having a Christian mom and dad does not get passed on to you. You cannot inherit salvation. Being baptized does not earn you a spot in heaven. It is only by grace that we are saved through faith in Christ alone. And it is his mercy that we are not sent to an eternity apart from him. That is the gift of salvation. It's offered to all people. This is the message that the Ethiopian heard from Philip. His gospel is our gospel. Verse 35 says, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus beginning with that scripture. In the very next verse, it says, as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. 
And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? We don't get a whole lot of detail of how Philip shared the gospel here. But we know that he did, and we know that he probably went further and explained baptism. We get to see an instant transformation in this man's life, and he immediately obeys scripture and is baptized. And I love the fact that they're in a desert, and they come upon water. That's just a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty. So these 14 verses here in Acts, where we get to see Philip share the gospel with a man he had never met, what a wonderful example of how we should be sharing that same message. Philip's message is our message. It hasn't changed. Jesus gives us a command in Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, This is an imperative statement to us as believers. Go, make disciples, share the good news that Jesus loves you, that he died for you, and that he wants your heart, and he wants you to obey and follow him. Our message is not, please hear me when I say this, it is not so that bad people get better. It's not to make people realize what they need to do for God, but rather what has been done for them. It's so that dead people are made alive, old creations becoming new through the power of God. I want us also to notice there was no shame in Philip's message. He was not sheepish or embarrassed of his message. He knew this was God's will for him to share and to proclaim Christ to this Ethiopian man. Romans 6, 1, 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed. I am not humiliated. Because Why? Because it is the power of God. The power of God is in this message that we have to tell. The power of God is what will transform your mean and nasty neighbor. The power of God will break the chains of addiction. The power of God will heal your marriage. And the power of God is what can save you from an eternity separated from God's goodness and mercy. As we conclude this morning, I want to give us some practical applications to take with us. When we talk about sharing the gospel, I know that it can be daunting. I know it can be intimidating. I know this because I'm no different. I'm not immune to it. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I do it perfectly. So I want to share three simple words that you can remember as you think about sharing the gospel. The first word is approach. We can't expect to share the gospel if we never approach someone and actually have interaction. We must go to people. We cannot wait for them to come to us. God did not say, be ready when people come to you. He said, go. We have this as a core commitment here at Calvary. Go, show, and tell the gospel boldly. So we must approach people. I know that not everyone is an extrovert. Some of you would like to cocoon away for a little while. I can lean that way also. It used to be my dream to buy 20 acres and have my own space off to the side. But I'm thankful that my wife pushes me into community. And I don't think the gospel allows me to live in isolation. And besides, I can't afford 20 acres in California. (laughs) So. But approach people. Pray for that strength and boldness for interaction. 
Don't wait for the opportunity. Be the opportunity. When there are messy situations, do you run from it? I'm, I'm thankful that God does not run from my mess. Instead, he runs to it. He came to heal the sick, not the well. It's really, really hard to see people for their need and not their sin. But if we are followers of Christ, then this is what we are called to do. So approach. The second word is ask. Many times the best way to start a conversation is to ask a question. Philip does it here. He says, do you understand what you're reading? So ask questions about their family, about their backstory, about their faith. Show an interest in their life. Don't stress if you're going to get the question right or not. God already knows that we will fail, but he still wants us to obey. If it's a friend or coworker, maybe you say, is there anything I can pray for? Praying for someone is a loving thing to do. For each of you, the questions will be different depending on the relationship. But remember that God has given you the relationship with them, and he wants you to engage with them. And church family, let's not fall prey to the idea of, well, I just need to build this relationship, and I need to build rapport with them. And then a year goes by, and you have yet to share the gospel. I think too often we give ourselves an out in saying that we are building a relationship, but we never share the gospel. If you need help thinking through this or strategizing, Pastor Reed and I would love to sit down with you. <coughs> We're not experts, but we would love to help and equip you. <coughs> and then the last word is allow. Remember to allow the Spirit to work. And brothers and sisters, I want to ease your mind right now. It is not up to you if they get saved. It's not. God in his sovereignty is drawing men and women to himself despite our efforts. However, it is an incredible privilege to join in with Christ and what he's doing. Remember, it's not our work, but rather it is the spirit that works in their heart before there is ever a conversion. In other words, there is always an inward working of the spirit before an outward change. Just like the spirit was working in that official before Philip arrived. He even had a copy of the scriptures from Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant passage, which is what Kiefer read for us. So pray and ask the Spirit to go before you and to begin working in their lives. Salvation is always, always initiated by God. It is God who begins the work, and it is God who sees it through. So be patient, be faithful, and allow God to work in their heart. In closing, I'd like for us to examine our own lives. We've seen Philip obey. He was bold. He shared his message. And this passage confronts us with how we are living. And the main idea today was God equips us in every way through the power of his spirit to walk in obedience. As you think of your own life, who comes to mind? Who is that person that needs to hear the gospel? Are you living in obedience to the Spirit of God? Are you listening to his prompting? I gave you those three words, and I, I hope it helps you in sharing the gospel. As we think about it, or as we think about who needs to hear the gospel, I would also like to give you just a simple phrase that you can pray. It's this. Use me. Pray to God. Use me. 
Use me in my work. Use me in my family. Use me in my neighborhood. Use me in my church. God is looking for people like Philip who are willing to be used. And my prayer is that we all want this for our lives. David Platt, who pastors a church in the D.C. area, he says, Jesus has not given us options to consider. He has given us commands to obey. Amen.